We're live. Oh, I'm standing. Everybody with mics. Yeah, because there's no help all over the place. So you can just walk from department to department. There's a walk space when you have to go out there anyway. And so when there's when it's lunch break, there's no fork truck traffic. So I would just go out there. But now that the weather's better, can just go from work down to like St. Stevens, across and back up. It's like 1.2 miles or something. But it's just a quick, like something to do at lunchtime. Just to get out. Just to get out. Just to fresh air, too. Sometimes it can be very helpful. I think they lined them up over there with the kind of masks that they're wearing. Before the storm, <laughs> we're all looking at our at our Everybody computer, saying, "Ooh, set. Chad has less than a minute." <laughs> okay. Here we go. Six thirty. Mm -hmm. All right, six thirty. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, call the meeting to order with a roll call, please, Mary. Beth Dillard. Here. Marsha Robinson. Here. Tony Here. John Crow. Here. Mary Here. Lisa Panzer. Here. Chad Here. Terry Here. All right, please join me in the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have uh, minutes from the regular meeting March 8th. February. Oh. I move for approval of the February 8th minute. Second. Second. That it's officially, open. just so it you're keeping, happened. if you're keeping track, that officially was not my mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it says March 8th on it. Ours says February. I have a special one. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> just so Chad can make it. All right, so we have a motion. And a second. And a second <laughs> to approve the minutes for February 8th. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All those not, same sign. All right, thank you for those that have joined us here in the library and those that are watching at home. Uh, it's a beautiful day. Uh, thank you for ending the day uh, with the Beaver Dam Unified School District Board of Education. We will move on to uh, public comment, which there is nobody signed up for public comment. We'll move to announcements. Uh, the board may recess into closed session per Wisconsin statute 19.85, parent one, parent C, considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility, specifically to discuss specific employees. The board will reconvene into open session for the possible transaction of business and adjournment. All right, uh, on to the agenda. I move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second for the approval of the agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 All those not, same sign. All right, let's move on to nine. 9.1, school of the month. Wilson School. By Mr. Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> He's never heard that before, I'm certain. No, never. <laughs> yeah, Chad, it's getting old. <laughs> Back in time. So, speaking of old, I don't know if you know Tim White. Uh huh. Just res I respect the guy a ton. He subbed for us a couple times last week. I had a second grade student say, Wow, Mr. Wilson, you and Mr. White look similar. <laughs> I was like, Gosh, that really kind of dates me. He's a little older. And then he goes, Mr. White has more hair. <laughs> so, anyway, that didn't feel very good. Double whammy. Yeah. So, that's where I'm at here. So Wilson Elementary School of the Month presentation. It is a privilege to be the principal at Wilson Elementary and a pleasure to give the presentation this evening. Um, kind of an overview of tonight's presentation. Um, I'm going to share with you because you're not able to get into the school this year. I have lots of pictures I want to share of some staff and students. And then we'll transition to um, the three school objectives and some of the rationale behind that. And then examples that we've intentionally uh, done this year to connect 
students to the school and the families uh, to the school, especially in the year of COVID. And then that'll conclude the presentation tonight. So that's a little overview. Um, elementary, Wilson Elementary. So right now we have approximately 135 students. Um, we started um, just a little over 100 this year, and we've gained 30, 30 students since mid-year. So our numbers keep increasing quite a bit. I mean, there was a time where we gained three, four, five kids per class, depending on the class um, when kids are transitioning back. Um, so our staff had, you know, has to transition quite a bit, our secretaries and teachers and custodial staff to make that happen. We have full, uh, nine full-time teaching staff, the six K-5 teachers. We have two 4K staff. And they spend half their day in the morning virtually, so they do virtual sessions in the afternoon, they're face to face with the 4K um, kiddos. Um, one full-time special ed teacher, uh, we have a .5 Phi Ed teacher who is new this year. Um, part of the planning this summer was not to have teachers transition during the day, so uh, working with Miss White, we're able to uh, add a .5 Phi Ed teacher at Wilson Elementary, she just works in the afternoons. And then we have traveling mapes from other schools on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. We are similar to Prairie View, or we are a non-SAGE school. Um, so that means our kindergarten through third grade classes are not capped at 18. So some years they're 22, 24. They don't really get much bigger than that. But we can have, depending on enrollment and kids moving in, we can have it. It's split between us and Prairie View. We can have a, quite a few kids transition during the school year. Um, and that's kind of what that means. I would describe our work environment as extremely supportive, caring, nurturing. And I think that extends itself not only to our staff, but also to our students. Um, it's just a real close knit, because of our size, just a close knit family feel at Wilson Elementary. And we take a lot of pride in our school and the successes of our students as they move on to the middle school and high school. Our last uh, state report card two years ago was a 78.5 in 1819. With some of the new changes that Mr. Peters has kind of updated the board on, um, that would, the new changes would affect Wilson positively. We would be actually moved into that highest threshold, uh, but would have been moved in that highest threshold on the state report card. Um, so I'm hopeful with the Ford exam this year that that's the trend that we, uh, we move in. Okay, now um, just kind of transitioning to some of the teachers and staff and students. So Aaron Garrity on the right and Caitlin Mears on the left, these are our two 4K teachers. Uh, this is our door deck. So we had Read Across America last week, which was awesome, a lot of fun things going on for the kiddos at school. On the left, I know the picture's not great, but that is actually um, Officer Tony Carroll, one of the BD local uh, police officers in town. So we set up um, virtual reading events um, and coordinated so that all the teachers log in. I would usually introduce the guest speaker and they would read to the school this past week. So he was one of the speakers on, he was actually on Monday this past week. Um, so it was kind of fun. Uh, this is Keel in kindergarten. She's reading a Dr. Seuss book to the kids. First grade, Mrs. Hook. Some small group work with a couple uh, students. Uh, those books in front of her are called the big books. They're purchased this year by our PTO, which was very nice of our PTO. Uh, second grade, this is Laura Blank. Here's a couple of her students identifying rocks, which is always fun, part of the FOSS science kit. Um, so looking at different uh, textures and uh, features of them to identify them by class. Third grade, Mrs. Whipperman. Uh, a couple of her students working on some FOSS science um, an experiment here. The smiles are underneath the mask. Fourth grade, Mrs. Sackett. Here's a picture of her class. She's got a class of 24 right now. It's our largest class at Wilson Elementary. And then fifth grade. So this is Wacky Wednesday. <laughs> Everybody dressed up in some like kind of funky clothes. And this was Mrs. Bowl. She really likes to to dress up for the dress up days for Read Across America. <laughs> so, kind of a cool picture. And then uh, I think Mr. Myers was there that day, but um, the students were working on a project for Black History Month. Um, a couple students working at their desk. A couple more fifth grade students. You can see Harriet Tubman um, on the right. And then a picture of our support staff. So on our left, Mrs. Cleese, um, moving to the right. Mrs. Schlefke in the middle, Katie Marquardt. 
in the pink, uh, Mikkel McClellan, and on the far right, Erica Howland, um, just a fantastic secretary at Wilson Elementary. And then Sue Beal is seated to the left, and then Sarah Real seated to the right. She's our custodian. Um, so that's the support staff at Wilson Elementary. This is our, our physical education uh, teacher. I don't know if anybody recognizes her, Kayla Murray. She's involved with the youth pro, uh, hockey program in town. Does an excellent job coaching as well as teaching. A couple fun activities at Wilson Elementary. So they had a bowling unit. Um, and then the last day she brought in a lot of neon tubes and kind of set up gutters and then lit the pins up um, and then dim the lights. The kids had so much fun. You could hear it like throughout the building of kids like just excited. I had kids, had a first grade kid, he was like, this was the best ever. I mean, he was so excited. <laughs> uh, just, yeah, really fun stuff. And then to the left here, she brought in buckets. So she would teach the kids how to tap out rhythms and beats, a lot of like music type stuff. And then she'd mix in calisthenics, and then she'd play segments of songs, and they would practice uh, what she had taught them. So just a really cool thing to see in person um, when she was doing that with the kids, with her five kids. Mrs. Brower, special ed education teacher, just a wonderful, uh, wonderful person. Um, so anyway, that was just a, a quick little overview of staff, our teacher support staff, and then some of the kiddos um, at Wilson Elementary. So switching in. Switching over now to the three um, school success plan objectives. So I wanted the, some of the rationale here is I wanted these objectives to be really rigorous. Um, and, if, and if what I've told my staff is that if I could have the perfect school, I would say I want every kid to be advanced or proficient every year of school moving from kindergarten to fifth grade. So when you looked at data, there would be no reds, there would be no yellows, all we would have is greens. Um, so thinking of that, we'll, um, I set these, the first couple objectives. So the strategic plan of the district, the first core strategy is student growth and achievement. So these first two objectives match up with that. So the way it reads is 80% of the basal 25% of Wilson students and this is K-5, as measured by the fall I-Ready diagnostic, will reach their stretch growth goal. Now that's a very rigorous growth goal that's set by I-Ready. And if the kids achieve this, they will close the gap within a short a period of time and actually be on grade level. And then I, and I want that to happen. I also want all students, regardless, to achieve 100% typical growth. So everybody grows a normal year's growth no exceptions. Um, so that's, and that's in the area of ELA. Now, after diagnostic number two, which occurred in January, we had 48% of our K-5 students on pace to reach their stretch goal, and then we had 76% of our students on pace to reach our typical growth. And the uh, grades three to five were just a little bit better, 50%, 81%. So, you know, looking at that data, I feel I feel good about it, but we do it. There's, you know, there's, there's areas that we definitely want to improve on. So what we've done to kind of target that first objective, in November, um, we had some title funds. We brought in Jan, or didn't bring in Jan Richardson, I wish. Um, virtually, our, our teachers attended one or two of the RISE workshops by Jan Richardson, and then we had staff present and then share out at our staff meetings. Um, so some awesome stuff that, that she has coming out of season six. Uh, meeting with Jesse Peters, one of the areas at the data dig of concern, which is mostly at our lower elementary, was an area of phonics. Um, so immediately I had Lindsay Lindy present at one of our faculty meetings, just strategies that she uses, that the, just re good reminders for the, for, the, for the teachers. And then uh, she presented some information on rhyme magic as well. I met with all staff mid-year um, for the teacher SLOs. And we looked at uh, those areas that are, those students that are part of the teacher SLOs. Um, a lot of those students are the basal 25% uh, and talked about strategies to, to, to grow those kids. Um, one neat feature of iReady is that it groups kids based off of areas they excel at or deficiencies and then it offers strategies for improvement. So that was one, one piece of the conversation that I had with teachers um, at those individual meetings. Um, we adjusted some TA support time based on need and then also 
adjusted some LST um, support based off review, review of data. So again, that's like usually adding a, a couple kids in first grade or a kid in, in second grade, or maybe removing a kid from a group and then adding some other kids that need some specific skills. Um, or targeted, targeted interventions. Um, so, so those are some of the things that we did to, to uh, kind of adjust to uh, increase that data for objective number one. Um, objective number two is written exactly identical except that it's based off of math. Our math data was actually a little better, which was fantastic. Um, so 62% of the K-5 students were on pace to reach this rigorous stretch goal. We set the bar to 80%. And then 76 as a 76 percent as a school were on pace to reach their typical growth goal. Now, if we look at just grades three through five, so I have, and I am so grateful and thankful. I have phenomenal staff, support staff, teaching staff, wonderful staff. Our my third grade through fifth grade teachers are really strong. So looking at their growth data, they averaged 115 percent growth in ELA. 100% for the year, which would mean they, they if you got 100%, that means they grew a typical, like typical year already. Mm -hmm. So on average, every student grew more than a typical year's growth already at mid-year wow. in ELA. And then 94% math. So they're almost at a, on average again, uh, a whole year's growth at mid-year. Um, so they are growing kids, they're doing a phenomenal job in the classroom. Especially in those three through, I mean, everybody is, but um, I think we excel in the grades three through five. And again, you know, the iReady stuff matches up very well with the Ford tests. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to taking, having the kids take those Ford exams um, in the spring here. So even though our ELA numbers looked, are better, uh, according to the iReady data, According to the school success plan, our, uh, we fared a little better with obje objective number two in growth uh, in, in math. Okay, moving on to objective number three here. So most of us are familiar with that school perception survey. The annually we give it, it gives us some good metrics on comparison. Um, our fifth grade class at Wilson last year um, scored a 2.95 in the area of connectedness. Just to give you a little background on that, um, there's a student engagement piece on that survey and it's got seven criteria. It's got like equity, wellness, connectedness. Those are all indicators of really how successful the kids are going to do in high school and post-secondary really in life. So the higher that number, the, the better the kids are projected to do. And this was a little area that we are a little bit low on. I think Prairie View might have had the same one, same area. Um, the questions read, um, do I feel like I belong at this school? That's one question. Do my students and classmates care about me? That's the second question. The third question um, is, you know, do I participate in one or more sports? And I can't remember. Anyway, there's four questions and it's, it's ranked by four is always and three is like usually and two is sometimes and then never. So just to kind of give you an idea. So in the fall when our third through fifth grades took it, we scored a 2.4. It's kind of low. And at mid-year, we scored a 3.10 on average, which is already higher than our score last year. And it's really, it's because we've intentionally, especially when we can't bring parents in and bring, you know, there's less things, we're less able to connect the parents this year, but we've intentionally done more things to bring parents in and connect the students. And I think that's the reason why. So I just want to share you some of the things that we're doing at Wilson Elementary to get more kids connected to school and get the families connected to Wilson Elementary. So every Friday morning, we do a virtual assembly at 845. And it's, the kids really look for it, it's, it's fun. So we have this little chant we do, and I call out their names um, as, a, as a school, it's pretty loud. Um, and then we give out, each, each teacher gives out an award for either excellence in a academics or behavior. So I get to announce the kids, the entire school claps. Um, and then we do drawings for little gifts, gift cards, that kind of stuff, and a little incentive there. But the best part about it for me is I get to call all the parents. So after I'm done with the meeting, I get to make the six phone calls, K through five, and the parents never expect it, and I get to pass on some awesome, great news to the parents, and they really appreciate those phone calls. 
Um, so anyway, that's a little another little piece that I'm able to reach out to those parents and make a connection with them. We did a parent survey back in um, late October to find out what things parents were interested in. Out of that, I um, created a, a Screencastify video of just tips um, for successful learning at home when we were making some of those transitions and we had some classes that were quarantined, so I did that, sent out a video. I made quite a few like Screencastify videos to uh, supplement stuff that we've sent out, but again, trying to connect a visual with words and you know connect to, connect to the parents. Um, we've done the MET. This was organized by most of the PTOs in the district, but we sent home a flyer and uh, popcorn on a Thursday, Friday, and uh, Matt Wilhelm, who was a famous like uh, cyclist, um, recorded, pre-recorded a, a short little segment we sent home to parents, and it was kind of like an at-home parent night to watch a movie, and the message was like anti-bullying, uh, kind of a perseverance type message, so a powerful message, plus again, more connection with at, at home, so. Um, I did want to show you um, one, get the mouse, I just want to show you part of a parent, one of these little parent videos that I make. I think I've ended up sending about 20 of them home this year, just to give you a sample. Hi Wilson families, Mr. Wilson here. I wanted to provide you some updates um, heading into next week. So I'm sure most of you received the district communication that was sent home about four o'clock. Um, all the elementary schools, including the middle school, are gonna uh, go virtual just for next week, um, which is that Monday the 19th, Tuesday the 20th, and then Wednesday the 21st. I wanted to provide you with some information with the, uh, the technology that will be sent home this weekend and how to access Canvas. So um, first of all, if you are, most students at the school have actively been using Canvas and really uh, the comfort level should be there and they have no problem um, logging in. But for some reason, if you do struggle, um, this is how you would access the username and password of your student. Uh, it's the first uh, five letters of last name and the first three of the first name um, plus zero, zero, zero. So for example, mine would be Wilso, uh, P-A-U, and then zero, zero, zero. And then my password, and this is if I was a student, um, would be just the B-D-U-S-D. And then those four digits right there are the four digits of the PIN number. So each student has a four digit PIN. So that's just it for the password. So uh, every student um, would have the same uh, protocol for username and password. Now once you get logged in, um, this is behind me. This is what a Canvas page would look like. Each Canvas page of each teacher here is gonna be set up very similar. It'll have a different uh, teacher's name obviously, but it has the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday button on it. So Monday, um, stuff will be posted by teachers by 10 o'clock in the morning. Most of our staff will have stuff posted by eight o'clock. Um, all your students are going to have to do here is just click on the button. Um, so I'm going to click on Ms. Whitman Monday, and then it pulls up a Monday page, and she has um, the language arts, which is ELA. Uh, she's got the learning targets, and then a brief description of what's going on. Uh, math is posted, uh, and then science. So these are all the days are going to be set up. Now, next week, what we're going to do is each uh, teacher is going to have a um, either a Asynchronous, that means like pre recorded um, teach an event for math uh, and ELA. So, anyway, I just want to provide an example for the school board of some of the videos that have gone home, just informational type stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, you have a sample of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, just a couple more examples of school connectedness. We, we have tried to have a few small parties. so before Christmas, Valentine's, a lot of times our PTO is super generous and they help us out with you know, a snack or something like that. Uh, Read Across America, we just finished up with. Just a, just a super exciting event for kids and staff. Uh, dress up days, door decks, we have individual and we have class competitions. So the way we connect with parents is that they have to bring home slips daily that the students read, log the minutes, the parents sign and we bring them back. Based off the percentage of students that return those, we add colors to Dr. Seuss's hat. So we have a billboard, we have a, a bulletin board set up, and then each class competes, and then I would announce, I did a daily announcement each uh, day, letting the classes kind of know where they're at. And then also we gave away, sponsored by a PTO, we gave away two bikes 
So I just gave a really awesome BMX bike to our fifth grade student who logged almost a thousand minutes last week reading. It was over two hours every day that he went home and read. Uh, it was awesome to call the mom and she was like, you know, he wanted that so bad. And I'm like, those are the types of things that you, that you want kids to learn in life, the connection between hard work and success. And then they get to silly string their principal and then Mrs. Bowl, the fifth grade uh, class one last week. So they get to, to do that coming up. So it's going to be a gene day, I think, at school. Um, and then I meet as part of my principal SLO. Um, I meet with my group of third, fourth, and fifth grade students. I've met with them four times this year. Um, just, you know, making that connection getting them excited about learning, doing check-ins with them to see how school's going, is there any feedback that I need to, you know, can I listen to them and make adjustments at school? Um, and then get them excited about some of those um, forward, exercise, forward testing that I ready that are coming up. So those are just a few more examples. And then looking ahead just for next year, you know, we do have kids that are not kindergarten or first grade, it's hard to be two grades below grade level, but we do have some fifth graders that are in the red on the iReady diagnostic. And it is so important as a district, and it, it, this is the dialogue that's going on at the district level, but it's gonna be so important moving ahead to, to close those gaps, get those kids to make more than a year's typical growth, achieve that stretch goal. And uh, next year, um, Mr. Myers and Mrs. Schieffer is kind of starting to lay the groundwork with RTI and uh, how we're gonna build some of that capacity in the PLCs. Already at grade level meetings, um, we're talking about essential standards, learning targets, and then next year we'll be doing more systematic targeted two, tier two interventions based off of that work. So I appreciate Upper Admin for, for having the vision to kind of lead that and we're doing the legwork um, with the staff at our schools. And then we get an upcoming staff meeting where I'll be talking about um, how we want that to work at Wilson, whether it's going to be like a wins time or a workshop model. Um, but, uh, you know, looking at data, we need to see like school-wide, are we missing things in Tier 1? And then if there's, you know, if we are adjust our Tier 1 instruction and if there's gaps with certain groups of students, we need to make sure that we are intentional and then helping those kids grow. Uh, and it really truly is about growth and achievement. Uh, Wilson's school report card only I think 13.6% uh, is based off achievement and like 43.6% is based off of growth. So it really is about growing kids. I mean, that's our job. So um, that's all I have uh, for tonight's presentation. So I'll be glad to answer any questions if you have any. Um, Paul, I just have a question. Is this the first year you have 4K? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And you have two classrooms of them? So it's one classroom, two teachers. Two teachers, okay. It's a okay. Re regular ed, special ed. Uh, this summer, our maintenance did the work and got our old multi-purpose room, which would be on the far end of the west side of the building. They redid that, and yeah, it's a nice little 4K classroom this year. Okay, okay. And the forward exam is expected to be taken when? So we have a, war, a wide range. It runs from March something to May, I think, 15th. So we're going to schedule most of our grades middle of April to take that exam. Oh, Probably okay. math a little bit on the tail end, just because they some of the units come a little bit later that they need like some of the geometry units. Okay. Well, I like the way you, um, you have had things to work together and. Uh, it looks like a lot of fun stuff going on as, you know, learning and fun. Did you have issues when some of the kids were out because of COVID and connection issues with um, virtual stuff at that point? So that's, I mean, it was more in the first half of the year. Okay. We did have classes that quarantined multiple times. We've had kids that probably have quarantined, quarantined three or four times each. Mm -hmm. So again, we're doing all we can on our end, but there are kids that, because they've been out for extended periods of time because of that, you know, there's, in the next few years in ongoing, there's gonna be constant, you know, areas that we need to work on as, you know, a school-wide initiative. Thank you. Yeah, and I can't say enough, like, I have a wonderful staff. I am so grateful, um, support staff, secretary, teaching staff. I've got a really nice group of people to work with. I feel very fortunate to be aware of that. And I have gotten feedback about how fantastic of a boss that you are. 
<coughs> and um, one of the stories was uh, like a snowstorm or something like that, and you helped shovel, and you're out there putting salt down in a blizzard. But uh, I have gotten some great feedback on how stellar you are as a supervisor, and I appreciate it. Thanks. We're small, so I have to. I wear a lot of different hats <laughs> on my bald head. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Yeah. yeah, I think also it was nice to see um, how you constantly uh, continue to reach out to parents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, parents, especially those that you want to be deeply involved in, in their kids, uh, you know, are probably missing that one part where they get to come to school and be involved. And it was nice to see how Wilson reached out to those parents and kept them engaged. So I thank you for that. Any other questions, comments from Mr. Wilson? We always enjoy going to the school, mm -hmm. and but at least this way we got to experience some of what happened as well. So thank you. Yeah, it's hard to pare it down. I mean, you have so many. I really have so many videos. Yeah. I could have shared in other mm -hmm. pictures, but I. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully things keep moving in the right direction, and we can hopefully get back and see some of the schools here uh, next year. Or so. Other questions, comments. Well done. Thank you very yeah. much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. All right. 9.2 Early College Credit Program. Good evening, everybody. Nice to see everyone here in our library. Mm -hmm. um, I will give a, just a real quick, because I know we have some newer people to the, to the board on Early College Credit. It's students who wish to take courses at a college, a partner college such as Moraine Park, and in this presentation I also have for Fox Valley Tech as well. Um, so for this go around for the fall of next school year, we have 10 students requesting uh, 14 different courses. Again, from uh, Moraine Park and Fox Valley Technical College, the courses range from certified nursing assistants to College 101, which is a required class for kids going on to tech school, as well as aviation has made some appearance on here, which I haven't seen yet since I've been here. Uh, computer literacy and graphic design, and some uh, sociology and psychology courses as well. Keep in mind that students oftentimes uh, request more than one because it is based on availability. So they list multiple just in case of their top choice doesn't pan out, then they can get into the next one, so forth and so on. So they're not necessarily taking five classes at a time. So I ask for your approval for these 10 students to participate in our early college credit program for just, next school year. I just have a question. Yes. Um, in regard to uh, the Marine Park, mm -hmm. I mean, we're, the high school definitely is real close mm -hmm. to Marine Park. Fox Valley Tech, what does that okay. mean for that student? Uh, it depends on the type of course so like some of these courses like aviation may only meet like once a week and it might be an evening program so oh. they would be driving over okay. or it could be that it's a late afternoon class so then that student leaves after half a day and then finishes it doing the okay the credits over at Fox Valley and those are hard to get in so I mean I hope the student can get something but it's very hard to get in those because those are pretty small yeah. groups for those types of courses. Other questions? I'll move to approve the early college credit program requests. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second then to approve the early college credit program request as presented. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Marge Jorgensen? Yes. Lori Flatt? Yes. Capro? Yes. Mary Coons? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. 9.3 Beaver Dam Area Community Foundation Proposal. So we had brought this to um, the operations committee. Um, so for those of you on that committee, this will be a, a nice review. Um, but bringing it to the full board, hopefully for approval to move forward with this. Um, so the Beaverdam Area Community Foundation um, reached out to us 
um, about establishing a charitable fund within their family of funds um, for the purpose of supporting education products here at the, er, projects here at the district. Um, so BDACF is an affiliate of the Fond du Lac Area Foundation, um, which is a nonprofit tax exempt organization um, established to receive charitable gifts, invest them with a goal of growth, and use the growth for the good of the community. So they invest the proceeds that they receive um, to enhance the donations uh, that are given to them. So this fund for us would allow community members um, or non-community members as it may be, um, the opportunity to donate money to a fund that would support uh, their particular passion in the district, be it music, art, sports, technology, et cetera. And then the money would be able to grow um, as part of the general fund of the foundation as a whole. So um, it would, it, you know, there's um, being able to pool the resources together helps with investment, uh, but then we would be able to see growth on that interest. So types of anticipated projects, um, and really it's, it's a broad range. These are examples, um, but there's um, not really a limit to the different types of things that could be done with the money. So um, tutoring programs, musical instruments, um, special events, um, mentoring programs for teachers, technical education, um, special equipment associated with that, um, special ed programs or equipment, anti-bullying programs, electronic devices. Essentially, it's, it's things that are above and beyond the scope of what the district would normally do financially. Um, so it opens up a lot of different opportunities for teachers or schools to be able to do something kind of special. Um, so startup funding, so um, we had received um, basically $1,000 pledges from um, uh, Patrick and Diane Lutz, as well as Tom and Judy Heffron to get this started. Um, and then there would be a committee. Um, the committee would be made up of BDACF board members and members of the district. Um, those members are yet to be determined if we move forward with this. Um, and then the committee would determine which projects get funded. So um, in most districts that have something like this, there's an application process. Um, so uh, teachers or schools could um, uh, fill out the application for what type of project they're looking for. It's typically pretty detailed, so there's a lot of thought required um, just to ensure that the project would be feasible and be able to be seen to completion. Um, and then, you know, we'd be able to determine which projects would move forward depending on how much money uh, we would have available or which types of projects we would be looking to fund in a particular year. So financially, so the education fund would be established as an agency fund within the BDACF family of funds. Um, and if you, if you go to that website, you can see all the different um, funds that exist already within the BDACF. So we would be one of those. Um, donations could be made online with a credit card, um, which is nice for some people, um, or by check, cash, uh, could be a, a stock contribution as well. Um, and then the donations would be held and maintained by the BDACF. So this is not something that would um, come into our financial um, accounts at all. This would be completely separate from us. Um, the foundation would oversee the investment of the assets and the fund would be non-endowed, uh, meaning that distributions could be made um, from the investment itself or the principal. So it wouldn't just be interest uh, that would be able to be used. We could actually use uh, the money itself. Um, so the marketing piece, we would have a link on our website that leads to the foundation's website. Um, and then we would market the, um, the opportunities for funding to teachers and schools. So letting them know how the process works, making the forms available, um, similarly to how we market scholarship opportunities for students. So we provide the information um, and the ability for them to um, take advantage of this if they want to. Um, and then the BDACF would also market the various funds, including ours, when they meet with people who are interested in making a donation I'm explaining that this is one way that their money could be used. 
Um, so in order to move forward with this, uh, what we're seeking tonight is board approval to establish the Beaver Dam Unified School District Education Fund um, as an agency fund within the Beaver Dam Community Foundation family of funds um, as set forth in and governed by the agreement between the parties. Um, so we have an agreement um, that was reviewed by legal counsel. It's, it's an agreement, it's not a contract. Basically it lays out, you know, here's what this fund is for. Um, and it explains who is responsible for um, monitoring and administering the fund. Um, so essentially um, um, the BDACF holds um, most of the responsibility for, um, for the money itself. And so we are um, the benefactor of the program itself, um, but we, we don't administer it or maintain it. Um, so our, our staff and our students um, get to see the benefit of that. So that's what we are looking for in order to move forward tonight. Any questions? I'm, I'm just going to comment. I, I am on the Beaver Dam Area Community Foundation Board, and so I will not be voting on this motion, um, but I am fully in favor of it. Um, the, the foundation has been doing very well in its partnership with Fond du Lac. The Fond du Lac Foundation's been in existence for at least 25 years and has done extremely well for their community. And we're looking to do the same thing here in Beaver Dam. So uh, this is another avenue to get some funding to some pet projects, perhaps, that some teachers or organizations here in the school would have. So I'm just throwing out that plug there. Yeah, I did some research on it, and it's actually pretty impressive on things that we might hear of every day that they do, like specifically the police department has three funds, one of which is the canine. The Dodge County Sheriff's Department does their SWAT unit funding through there, um, some fundraising. There's just tons of stuff that I didn't realize was actually filtered through them that yep. is kind of an everyday mm -hmm. buzz that you hear about. So it's pretty cool. There's a number of nonprofit organizations that have endowment funds that have put their endowments in with this. It, they're still their endowment, but it provides a little bit greater fundraising opportunity when you're working with other funds in general out of it. So that's got some distinct advantages. And Anne-Marie, just one quick question. So in order to obtain these funds, someone, be it staff, potentially a student, would have to request that amount? Correct. Submit right. an application, and then the committee made up of some BDUSD members along with the foundation would decide which of those activities or proposals would get funded, correct? Right. Correct. So most mm -hmm. of the, um, there are a lot of districts that have something similar to mm -hmm. this. So uh, most of the applications will actually ask for a relatively detailed budget mm -hmm. for what is intended to be spent. Um, so that's what they would be requesting as a dollar amount to fund their project. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, if not, I'd like somebody to bring forward a motion. I would move that we accept moving in with the Beaver Dam Area Community Foundation, um, approve the proposal. Second. So we have a motion and a second then to approve the proposal to establish the Beaver Dam Unified School District Education Fund as an agency fund within the Beaver Dam Community Foundation family of funds. Uh, roll call vote, please. Yes. John Close? Yes. Mary Cruz? Yes. Lisa Tanger? Yes. Chad Yes. Gary Spielman? Yes. Doug Dillake? Yes. Mark Ferguson? Abstain. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. That'll move us on to the return to school plan update. Mr. DeStefano. All right, well, as much as I enjoy this, I feel like every time we talk about it, it gets us closer to not having to talk about it. So that's good. It's, 
It's been almost a year um, since we embarked in this journey together. Um, I've got a few updates to provide the board and the public. And then at the end, I also have uh, three requests for action from the board. Uh, there'll be hints of those requests during different parts of the, uh, of the presentation. <coughs> so first, a uh, general update on monitoring. We're still doing the things that we have been uh, relative to the conversations on a very regular basis, weekly basis with the health department, area superintendents, et cetera. Um, we are in phase two as a county and the Harvard model reflection would now put us in uh, the yellow category. What does that mean really for most people that probably has uh, most to do with capacity. So that puts capacity um, at 50% for uh, businesses, other groups um, in, the, in the community, but all the other recommended protective and preventative protocols generally speaking, would remain, remain the same. Uh, we continue to monitor uh, district boundary reports. Um, our average daily increase as of Friday, I wanted to put today's in there. I think it's up now, but when I kind of got to the point where I was like, I, I need to put this in the board folder, I, I just let it be and it wasn't in there at that time today. So I used Friday's, it was a 1.7, a daily rate increase. So context, one month ago it was 2.5 and two months ago it was 7.1 for an average daily increase within our district boundary. So again, a very positive trend in that it is going down and we continue to publish our uh, weekly district COVID-19 numbers on the website. So I know the numbers are getting small. Um, I just don't wanna lop off kind of what was the, the, the really tough part that we navigated in the fall yet. So. I'm, I'm leaving it on there for context at this point. Um, but as we can see over the last uh, two months, three months really now, uh, we've seen a really uh, significant de decrease in the impact that COVID-19 has had on us um, relative to case rate and quarantines. Um, this last Friday, uh, we had um, an extremely uh, positive outlook. Uh, we are at zero cases for staff and students. Um, student quarantines were at the lowest they've ever been, which is nine, and staff quarantines were zero. Our current academic instructional model, we, we have been five days a week in person, 4K through five for the entire school year. Obviously we had some uh, specific times where we intentionally were uh, virtual throughout the district, um, but generally speaking, five days a week in person, 6-12, as of February 1st, had moved to four days a week in person. So that's Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. We currently serve, uh, still continue to serve a number of students through a virtual delivery model. That is a choice that our families have had throughout um, this entire school year. So currently, uh, the numbers are 17% of our students are being um, served through the virtual model 4K through 5. Of the middle school, 21.1%. High school, 27.9, the DSLA is 7%. Our quarter four projected, we did some uh, surveying, communicated with parents, trying to get a uh, quarter four commitment so we could go ahead and plan forward. And uh, I assume these, um, these percentages might adjust slightly, uh, but based on the numbers that we had at the deadline of the um, survey that we were using to garner this feedback, uh, we see that our percent uh, participation virtual drops almost 7%, 4K through 5 for quarter four. Uh, middle school comes down a couple of percentage points. Uh, high school stays very similar, but also comes down a couple of percentage points, and the DSLA holds, um, holds true. So not recommending any changes to the model. Um, I know every once in a while I'll get a question about 612 and the possibility of bringing back uh, the Wednesday piece, the, the fact of the matter is we look at those percentages, we consider our population, we still have several students, hundreds and hundreds of them that are being served virtually. Mm -hmm. um, our staff are providing that service, so we continue to see the Wednesdays as a very practical and appropriate uh, day to be uh, virtual so that those needs can be met and teachers can uh, use some of that time to plan, reach out, or otherwise um, as well. So. Uh, not recommending any changes to the current academic instructional model. Relative to vaccines, so very, very good news. Um, we are, of course, really appreciative of the Marshfield Medical Center and 
the Dodge County Health Department, all of the staff that were interested um, had the opportunity to receive round one vaccinations last week. So uh, based on the numbers that had been vaccinated through the, the 1A uh, category designation or partial 1B, um, as well as last week, we're well over 350 staff that have made that choice. Um, staff were vaccinated in the Beaver Dam Unified School District at least last week uh, using Pfizer. Um, I believe Dr. White, some of them perhaps in the past um, through the 1A or partial 1B may have also received Moderna, but uh, the efficacy rates for those two vaccines are definitely the highest, um, which is good. I think that's just good context to have. I'm not saying that that's better than the, the Johnson and Johnson, but um, the scientists say that it is, and um, we're excited about that. Uh, round two vaccinations are scheduled for the week of March 22nd. So feedback from that's been really positive. It was very, very smooth. Um, and uh, again, really, really appreciative of uh, the fact that uh, Marshfield Medical Center and the, and the County Health Department uh, came through for, for our district. And that's really a big weight too for the whole county and that allows some other things to be flowing uh, for them uh, because there's obviously uh, several other teachers that are being vaccinated. Some of them had been vaccinated in other school districts um, at the end of last week, now this week. So that's a, that's a good thing for the entire county. Uh, FFCRA update. So the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, as the board knows, um, had expired at the end of the 2020 school year. Um, that act had provided some federal funded, federally funded relief for staff that fall ill or become quarantined and or provided coverage for staff unable to work due to a child's school closure. So in February, when the board uh, last extended this through March, um, we had, I believe it was um, 130 staff members that had fallen under that relief. So um, as of, we'll say today, maybe the number is more accurate of Friday, but as of today, 172 staff members um, have been able um, to um, take advantage of this opportunity through the extended relief. That carries a $45,000 value to it. I don't wanna say it's a $45,000 cost because um, it's not like we're paying uh, staff when they're out. It's that we're deferring the reality, the impact of their absence uh, by covering that absence and keeping them whole in their use of absences, et cetera. So, uh, but it has a $45,000 plus value to it. Something that we believe is uh, very manageable um, and we also see the projected use of this going down significantly, particularly since uh, both cases are going down significantly in the community and we're vaccinating staff. Uh, several districts have extended the relief further through the uh, school year. I'm not gonna say the majority, but several. Um, and at this time, um, and again, the, the recommendation will be at the end of the uh, presentation as well, but recommending that we extend the relief provided by the FFCRA and funded by our district now through May 28th. So I wanna put a date on it, and that would be the last date um, through May 28th of 2021, and then effective May 29th, um, any said relief would end. Uh, activities and facilities. So there's, there's kind of two slides on this, so volunteers, visitors, and access, and activities and facilities. So there's some connectedness there, just different headings. Um, so right now we're in the alternative fall season. So the alternative fall season uh, is volleyball, football, and boys so soccer. So that is, uh, that is underway, um, although that looks a little bit different because the, the weather isn't completely cooperating, although it's a beautiful week. Um, but that's happening, and we actually had our first uh, volleyball home event last week, which was uh, also streamed uh, live, which was nice. Uh, we are planning for a homecoming in April. I believe the theme is, or the, the title of the homecoming is NOCO, which I, I never really asked what that means, and I don't necessarily want an elaborate definition <laughs> right now, but it sounds completely innocent. Um, so we're gonna run with that. And then uh, prom is slated for May. Uh, we, we plan to host these events. Many districts, the majority of districts that I work with, either Dodge County or the Badger Conference, are working hard to provide set events. Um, most of them bailed on homecoming, aren't gonna revisit it in any, any way, shape, or form, at least in the Badger Conference. Um, but a number of them are, um, and the majority are indeed trying to do something 
for prom, so we will be doing something um, as well. We wanted to do that. Uh, we will plan on having like a grand march event um, for our students, allowing both the, the seniors to be recognized because they missed out on the opportunity last year, and then also the, the juniors, and then um, Russ and um, his team and Melissa Gearing and the advisors are working through that um, very well. Did we ever consider prom being a masquerade? Uh, that is, that is uh, really good. That's really clever. I appreciate that. I, I think you just got us some likes on YouTube. Um, I'm certain Abby will take that back for me. That is, that's clever. Uh, <laughs> or at least don't come So, um, something else too that I didn't, I didn't put in this presentation, but uh, Russ has been hounding me on this because I know he wants to get some communication out. So, um, you know, uh, you see April, May, and then you think, well, at the end of May, um, don't we have graduation. you know graduation? <laughs> what's going on? And I, that's, well, it's it's still early March, but. Uh, we're, we're going to have a graduation. Um, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but we're going to do everything we can to make it as grand of a, an event as possible. The key here is that we're going to do everything we can and commit to having these events, and we're going to review these with the health department so that whatever we do uh, falls in line with something that they can support. Uh, specific to facility use, um, at this time, and I know we've talked about it uh, for the last couple of months, or talked about it a few months ago, and. Um, we had we'd made a strategic decision as a district to to delay and monitor, see how things were with the change in the model and um, see how things were with the, the cases in the community. But I'm recommending that effective immediately, the ESC be open up for outside group access. Now, some people might balk at that, um, saying like, what, what could possibly be done at the ESC? Well, there are outside groups that will use it for meeting places or other things. Um, and logistically, it's easier to make adjustments to. So um, if the board's willing, I'll be asking them here at the end to, to just open that up and let us allow outside groups to use that. Um, and then effective March 22nd to open up the middle school and the high school for outside group access. Uh, why March 22nd? Well, there, there is more planning and coordination and efforts that'll go into this if the board makes a decision. Um, that's not that far away. That's the, the week right after uh, spring break. And there are some logistical things that we would want to be able to adjust and, and plan for and then work with those groups to try to provide them opportunities for access. Um, of course, any outside groups that use the facilities would have to engage in preventative practices and protocols that would be required by the district. And those things are subject to some, some changes and considerations. Um, you know, we're not, we're not looking to allow outside groups to come in and host large scale events. Uh, that would have a significant number of spectators or again do anything that would be contrary to what the health department is asking us to do our best to model facilitate and be good stewards of ourselves um, you'll also notice on there that uh, the elementary schools are not referenced and at this point in time I'm not recommending that we open up the elementary schools um, and there's two reasons for that one the middle school and the high schools have uh, much larger staffing um, in the in our on our custodial teams, so it's easier for them to flex and adjust for increased use um, and things that are going to take maybe some time away or have to result in some diverted time and attention to clean up, set up, take down, monitor, etc. And um, at this point in time in the year, elementary use gets very very light for indoor pieces. Now, March is still kind of a sensitive time because it all depends on how spring is. So there might be some groups that want to use it. Um, but once we get into the end of March and really get into April, everybody in Wisconsin who can be outside for something likes to be outside. And uh, the middle school and the high school um, have, I don't want to say, um, a lot of space and opportunity uh, because right now these next three to five weeks could be really tight at the middle school and the high school. Um, but. The, the reality is we generally see lighter use. And again, going back to from a staffing standpoint, the elementary custodial teams and our resources are much more limited. And we would typically only have one custodian second shift at the most. Sometimes it's, it's half or it's a split person. So the capacity is different there. And what we don't want to do is have them having to divert time to monitor or clean up after other things that could be going on and take away from the time that they're using to clean up uh, the classrooms and other facilities. So 
we're very fortunate to have the spaces that we do at the middle and the high school um, for the groups that might want to use them for you know reasons associated with let's say uh, youth sports or other activities and um, if and when there is space available I know our teams will do a good job in trying to schedule and work with them to accommodate their needs volunteers visitors and access so recommending that effective on April 5th we allow for volunteers and other partners to serve in person and or um, and in our buildings during the school day to support students and staff in priority areas that would uh, include but not be limited to academic and social emotional support at the discretion of the building principal so essentially we have different partners or volunteers that um, have traditionally been able to come into our buildings to support academic instruction and other things that we're trying to achieve um, and um, if that is a high need area and if we're able to accommodate that and the principal believes that it's a priority value and um, you know the, the volunteer is, is interested and willing to follow all the other protocols I don't see an issue in that happening I think that would be a, a good nice next step and also advantageous obviously for our students um, and then also plan to allow for recruiters volunteer coaches and other volunteer supports to also be able to engage in approved activities on campus outdoors at the discretion of the principal so as it gets nicer during lunches for example at the high school uh, there's other opportunities or even after school with volunteer coaches um, it's nice to just allow those people to to be around on campus uh, to connect with our students in different ways there's a lot of ways that we can do this safely um, and we'd like to uh, open things up a little bit more is so there, is there a like a general understanding with the health department on our field house as to capacity from an event standpoint uh yes and no like can you be more specific like i mean right now if we have an event are we like kind of like trying to stay within a certain percentage of capacity yeah so um there's there's a couple different ways to look at it so uh right now like if you look at the plan and they don't consider us you know we're not we're not a restaurant but you know some people look at the plan they'll say 50 percent capacity i thought the thing could hold 3,000 people let's stick 1500 people in there well you know they have to sit somewhere and there's a spot where the actual events taking place so um, all those other factors um, so you know generally speaking what what they have done is talk with us about the nature of the specific event and then we talk about like what would the total uh, number of people in that event be um, because part of their other concern is it's not just when the events taking place it's like when they're coming in when they're leaving in those pieces so uh, right around 25 percent at this point in time seems to be really reasonable for the field house uh, because of the flow that we have because of, because of the space etc but um, we don't have like an absolute max capped specifically designed um, and it continues to possibly change so and obviously the understanding is is that these outside groups uh, based on our approval tonight would still follow mass mandate inside our building correct so the formal actions that I am requesting um, the board to consider this evening would be uh, the one regarding outside group access of indoor facilities so um, again effective immediately ESC be opened up for outside group access March 22nd which is the Monday following spring break middle school and high school will be opened up for outside group access uh, any and all outside groups uh, would have to engage in preventative practices and protocols as required by the district um, and then effective on April 5th we allow for volunteers and other partners to serve in person and in our buildings during the day um, in priority areas and that would be at the discretion of the building principal and then the third would be the extension of the relief provided by FFCRA uh, through May 28th um, and then sunsetting on May 29th um, one thing that um, I know I believe that uh, the board has talked about previously had to do with breaks and time after breaks and uh, when we had taken extended time just to clarify um, following um, holiday breaks or other breaks uh, where there was going to be um, more likely congregation of individuals one our community case numbers were different the phase we were in was different and those uh, types of breaks tended to 
intended to bring uh, groups of people in closer proximity with one another. Because of where we're at right now, uh, the health department is not recommending that we take any time afterwards. So based on those conversations, I'm not recommending any type of move to virtual or otherwise following spring break. That's why that recommendation is not on this evening. Any questions? So one question I have, and you guys may be on top of it, but what does the schedule look like for the teachers in their second round shot? Is it all in one day or how does that spread out? So it's spread out. It's literally what was really nice about the whole process is, um, you know, you came in and actually before you even got, I believe before we even got the first shots, um, you actually had your second shot scheduled. Um, so it was literally three, was it three weeks, with the Pfizer? Three yeah. weeks to the day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for the people who were like a Wednesday, uh, they'd be a Wednesday. People who were a Thursday, they'd be a Thursday. People who were a Friday. So it's spread out over three days. The other thing that Nicole and her team has done is proactively, um, you know, we're positioning ourselves for the, the prospect of possibly having uh, some more absences associated with that was um, my question. some of the impact. So we want to, we, we, we want to plan for having school. Um, it's spread out over three days, and the, the, I think the percentage, last time we talked, um, and I, Nicole had reviewed this more extensively than I did, but um, the percentage of people who had um, um, effects from the second dose vaccine that would have prevented them from maybe working was around 25%. Uh, those people. So we figured based on that kind of, we'll say, I don't want to say worst case scenario, but based on that percentage of impact and spread it over three days, we're hopeful that we'll be able to sustain instruction and not have to cancel school. Yeah, that was my question. So I know like the fire department, they did it on their down days, so they were off Yeah. the day they got the second shot. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some districts, because of where their spring break fell, um, it winds up being like their second shot winds up being over spring break. Um, which some people didn't necessarily like either, obviously. Um, but for us, it's spread out over three days, and uh, we're optimistic we'll be able to sustain instruction because if, if it really is, you know, the, they've, they've got a, a lot of data to support that it, it seems to be only affecting about 25% of the population to that extent. Uh, hopefully, it's something that we're, we're going to be able to manage. Question. <coughs> Any other questions? Looks good. As we look at uh, as we look at motions, just a note probably just makes most sense just to do each of these separately. The the last one's gonna need a roll call vote anyway, so mm -hmm. just note that. Well, I'll move that effective immediately. The ESC be open up for outside group access, effective March twenty second. The middle school and high school be opened up for outside group access. And any and all outside groups accessing the facilities must engage in preventive practices and protocols as required by the district. Second. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second <clears throat> then. Uh, for the first bullet point, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those not, same sign. All right. Take I'll, a second motion. I'll also move that effective on April 5th, we allow for volunteers and other partners to serve in person and in our buildings during the school day to support students and staff in priority areas, including but not limited to the academic and social emotional support at the discretion of the building principal. Second. A motion and a second then for the second bullet item. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those not, same sign. All right. And Take I move for, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. for yep. an extension of the relief provided by the FFCRA funded by the district through May 28th, 2021, and effective May 29th, 2021, any said relief would end. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second for the third bulleted item. Uh, roll call vote, please. Yes. 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 All right. Thanks, Thank Mark. You. Brings us to 9.5 recognitions. Anybody have any recognitions that I'd like to share tonight? 
Well, I just had a comment. I, I was, I thought I was kind of aware of what uh, organizations or commit uh, groups or things that the school district offered, but um, I was not, uh, interested to find a picture on the high school uh, newsletter where it talked about the students who were in the Health Occupation Students of America group and that they recently participated in some regional level competition and were quite successful. And so um, I was interested about that and I would like to recognize them for their, um, for their participation and, and um, success in wherever they move on the levels. And also, I guess I never knew that we had bowling teams. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and I see that the girls' bowling team was able to get together again this year. And uh, so good luck to all the teams. It's good to have some other opportunities that some, if you're not a good basketball player, maybe you're a good bowler. Yeah, I'll piggyback onto that for the, the coaching staff and the sports and athletics and everything. My daughter's in uh, soccer and just how they've adapted I think is pretty Fantastic. I mean, it's a totally different year for sports in general, and it's pretty much flowing very smoothly. So my daughter's loving it, and props to all the, the athletic staff out there. Mark, anything else? Uh, a little bit of a, a repeat, but uh, as we know, the mock trial team had gone to state. They actually performed this past weekend. They had uh, two rounds on Saturday and two on Sunday. So uh, to the team and the, the seven students that actively participate in the tournament, congrats to them. Uh, there are only 10 teams uh, in the state that get to do that. So that's, uh, that's a big deal. We're actually still waiting for final results. So we know that we didn't win it because um, they apparently announced like the, the top couple getters. Um, but we still, we still don't know how all the final ratings uh, panned out. So we'll find that out soon enough. And, uh, but just congrats to that mock trial team, and they're already talking about uh, next year's plan, so that's pretty exciting, the kids, so that's awesome. Um, and then um, I guess kind of a recognition and a, a shout-out. It's testing season kickoff officially tomorrow, uh, so that starts with the ACT here at the high school, so I want to thank the high school team uh, for everything that they've <laughs> done and uh, Jesse Peters for his support and work with, uh, with the high school team. For that, so a lot of unique challenges and opportunities uh, related to even testing, um, and that has to do with accountability, and that ties back to our strategic plan and everything that we're trying to do from a growth and achievement standpoint throughout the entire district. So, kickoff starts with the ACT, um, that'll flow into um, Aspire and Forward and um, all those other exciting things. So, it's already underway, and there's still snow outside, but uh, here we go. So, good luck to those kids, and thanks to all the staff that helped put that together. Anybody else? I guess we can just recognize Mary for joining us on the board, this being her first meeting. <laughs> yes, welcome, Mary. Very appropriate. Thank, Thank you. Nice. All right, let's move on to reports by the board. We'll start with 10.1. Abby. All right, hello. Um, I had some of my thunder stolen tonight, already touching on athletics and clubs, because that was my whole presentation for tonight. Way to All go, right. Tony. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so as we saw, the end of the winter sports. Um, so I'm going to start with boys swimming. They were able to have their whole team move on to sectionals, and that is also a co-op between the Beaver Dam High School and Whalen uh, Girls Bowling. They went to state this past weekend and they placed ninth. Moving on to girls basketball, they ended as regional champs and they made it into the sectional semifinal. And in the conference, they went six and oh. And then staying with basketball, we have boys basketball. They were first seed going into playoffs. They made it to the regional finals and they had a great regular season. They set many um, individual records as well as team records. And in the conference, they went 8-0. So both basketball teams went undefeated in the conference. Uh, wrestling, they had an individual qualify and move on to the state competition. And the powerlifting team, it's not technically a sport here at the high school. It's not run through the WIAA. But they were able to host a meet here at the high school, which was their first ever. And I know 
powerlifters were really excited about that. They've been trying to do that for a couple years now. And then closing it off with uh, the alternate season sports for athletics. Um, volleyball, their season has already started, and last week they had a game. Football and boys soccer have not had any games yet, but they've started booming into a few practices and having contacts in open gyms. And then for the end of my presentation, clubs here at the high school, we heard about HOSA earlier. They had many members um, move on to the state competition. That was both individual and team events. And mock trial, they moved on to state. And they took first at their regional competition, which is a huge deal. Um, for the past, I don't know how many years, the same team had been taking first. And Beaver Dam was continually getting second place, but they knocked out that competition. And mm -hmm. they took first. And awesome. they had state this past weekend. FFA, they unfortunately have not been able to have any competitions yet, but they're still practicing and they have some of their leadership events coming up here in the future in April. So that concludes my report on athletics and clubs. What is HOSA? HOSA? Um, health occupation. Yeah, I'm a member of HOSA. I'm an officer in that. It's like Health Occupation Services of America. Um, it basically prepares students for um, their uh, if they plan to go into the health field, it prepares them by showing them different events and ways to compete in it. Like I do the CPR and first aid, so I know all CPR and first aid. I'm qualified through that, through like lifeguarding, and then I go on and compete on dummies through mm -hmm. a virtual competition. Um, it's such a wide variety. It has job skills, leadership, there's nutrition, just everything you can think of in the health field, there's some competition for you to do, and it really helps prepare you, and colleges love to see it. It even goes on to college. There's HOSA um, clubs in college, too. So it's a really great program to like learn about and grow in it for your future. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's what I, I, when I saw that in the newsletter, I was really impressed, because, I mean, talk about you know biomedical laboratory and um, all that different type of thing that's that's really, you know, top-notch type of things to learn. Yeah, most definitely. And you're, you've, you've been working on that too, great. Yeah, great. the reason why you haven't heard of it before is because it started rolling my sophomore year of high school, so that was about two years ago. Okay. We started talking about it and we attended a competition, the state competition, to see if it's something we'd wanna to introduce to the high school and it officially became a club last year. Okay, Yep, great. so it's fairly new. Thanks. It's always great seeing all the opportunities that, uh, that the kids have outside of just coming to school every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's nice to see. It's also nice to, uh, to see that recognition from a peer. So, you know, all these uh, clubs in athletics, uh, we always recognize them from a board standpoint or Mark does from a superintendent standpoint. It's nice to see them recognized from a peer. So we appreciate that as well. Any other comments, questions for Abby? All right, thanks, Abby. Yeah. Uh, that'll move us on to Operations Committee. Operations Committee met February 22nd. Um, board members present in person or virtually that serve on the committee were myself, Marge, Tony, and Joanne Tijeski. Um, Ms. Malkovich, our Director of Business Services, provided us with an update of the 2020-2021 budget. She shared some information regarding the CARES Act and the ESSER fund, which is contained within it. The amount of funds received and how they were used was reviewed. And then she shared the amount that the district will potentially receive in the next round of funding, which the Department of Public Instruction anticipates will be in April. Um, the, any funding that we receive, then the district will have until 2023 to use those funds. Um, and as far as the money that we have received to date our district as of excuse me as of january 31st district expenditures were at 44.33 percent of the budgeted amounts which is on track with previous years so we're even with some of the changes to the school year we're staying pretty close and i know that's the anticipation of ms malcomish and everyone else to keep us on that track uh, timing of some expenditures will be different I just said that, sorry. That's what happens when you paraphrase. <laughs> but, um, 
and, and also some of the timing will be different because of the five-year facility plan and summer maintenance projects, uh, which will take place this fiscal year, and then some higher maintenance expenses this year. Anticipated revenues from events and activities will also likely be lower because we clearly haven't allowed spectators. Um, the state budget process will continue to be followed and considered as uh, the district's 2021-2022 budget is developed. Um, the next item, Dr. White, our Director of Human Resources, presented some adjustments regarding certified staff contract language. Um, and I believe you have a copy of that in your, your packet. The update includes a statement um, that staff, uh, every certified staff member agrees to abide with the collective commitments set forth by each of the sites they serve. So, for example, certified staff only at the high school will be asked um, to sign that they are aware of the commitment for that building and that they fully intend to help that building reach its commitments. Um, the staff will be provided with the collective commitments, like I said, of each building they serve. So if you happen to go to two buildings, you might have slightly different commitments, but very similar. Um, and I believe that with our conversation tonight, uh, we also need to ask for approval of that language so that as our certified staff is issued their contracts for the upcoming years, that they'll be up to date. So I would move that we approve the um, contract language as presented tonight, including the commitments. Get a second on that? Second. We have a motion and a second then to approve that contract language change regarding collective commitments. All in favor? Aye. 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 All those not, same sign. And then the last thing we uh, Dr. White covered was an update on staffing planning, which included a timeline and objectives beginning in February and ending in June. And the timeline included staff board and contract responsibilities. Uh, she also explained that English language learner services will increase in 2021-22 to include an additional ELL tutor, teacher, and a community liaison. And that three instructional coaching staff will also be added. Um, the staff is brainstorming and looking at ways to bolster mental health supports for students that could include existing staff and contracted services as they continue to review and plan. Uh, there is no meeting scheduled for March. Our next meeting is scheduled for April 26, 2021, I believe at 530. All right, teaching and learning. Teaching and learning met on February 15th. Board members, uh, board committee, me committee members present were John Krause, Gary Spielman, and me. Um, Mr. Meyer explained that the schools are, were developing the collective commitments that we have just approved in the certified staff contract language update. Um, this is part of the district's implementation of the professional learning community philosophy, and it's part of the foundation on which the annual and daily work will be built. The commitments will clarify priorities, sharpen focus, and set tone for the direction of the school. They will also define and guide behavior to achieve the desired success. He reviewed samples and shared the process of developing the commitments. Mr. Meyer also reported that the middle school is currently evaluating modifications to their course offerings and schedule to ensure that they support our students' needs. The school team is reviewing the 2022-2023 adjustments and schedule. There also are adjustments to the 2021-2022 schedule to include offering physical education all year rather than just by semester, which will then return the Project Lead the Way courses to their original nine-week schedule. Project Lead the Way computer science for innovation apps creators will become an elective option for seventh and eighth grade students rather than a required course. Science and social studies will remain in an 85-minute block as it is this year. Mr. Meyer also reviewed a summary of the English language learning program recommendations that were a result of, of the independent programming review. The recommendations will be utilized to plan uh, to better meet the needs of our students moving forward. The review team will meet periodically to receive continual feedback as the recommendations move toward implementation. Mr. Meyer also provided the achievement gap reduction AGR semester report 
Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln are the schools in the district's AGR. He provided the background on the goal and the requirements, reviewed the 2020-2021 school plan from each school along with their data report. We will also not meet in March due to the board workshop. Our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, April 19th. All right, thank you, Lisa. Um, anybody at the board would like to share any engagement opportunities during the course of this last month? So as everybody knows, I'm on the fire department and I got a chance to meet with the student services group. Um, the volunteerism is declining at a very rapid rate. We went from 30 paid on call firefighters to about 15 or 16. So one of the remedies we're looking at was getting in the school and we had some great conversations and the fire department will be here in May, especially now that we approved outside groups and we're gonna do kind of a recruiting event um, outside of the commons area in the front turnaround there. So pretty excited. There was a lot of good conversation with it. Some of it too was the college credits and getting kids into EMT basic and even bringing in like the nursing, you know, kids that are going to school for nursing or have that career path. It's also beneficial to take an EMT class. So we will be doing much more on that front. It was a very, very cool conversation. Thank you to the student services team. Anybody else? Just briefly, we did have um, uh, the week of the last board meeting, uh, just following it, we did have uh, uh, parent advisory and staff advisory. Uh, parent advisory was highlighted by uh, conversation around parent community communication. And uh, the uh, staff advisory uh, was highlighted by, uh, you know, a pretty candid and good conversation regarding uh, um, supports and additional supports to get us through here and, and finish the year strong. So that was good. I also sat in on a safety team uh, meeting. And that safety team meeting, we talked about uh, some general COVID response updates, um, upgrading some uh, security uh, cameras, and then uh, putting together um, a possible plan and training for uh, reunification. So anybody else, any other engagement opportunities? All right, with that, I'll take a motion to move into closed session. I move the board recess into closed session per Wisconsin statute 19.85, parent one, parent C, to consider employment promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility, specifically to discuss specific employees. The board will reconvene into open session for the possible transaction of business and adjournment. Second. Motion a second then to move into closed session. Roll call vote, please. Mary Cook? Yes. Lisa Panzer? Yes. Jeffrey? Yes. 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 All right, we'll take five and then uh, we will obviously reconvene after close. You don't need these. Yes, no? No. Okay. Do not need those.
Jesse, you have a good night. Thanks, Paul. You too. She was talking about how you're like one of those that are so like down to the ground. You're so good at it. And I was like, yeah, other presentations at the board because they're so like straight to the point. You know exactly what he wants and what he's saying. I appreciate that. Yeah. I appreciate that. I'm glad, I'm glad it comes out that way. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it's like Mopan's presentation? I was in Mopan for five years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. See, like my whole thing with Mopan, I coached in that program. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's my whole thing. Like, um, was I in the school of choice with Mopan?
super excited.
Did we need to get your tire fixed yet? Oh, yeah, my brother's doing it tomorrow before school. How did you get here? Um, I took my mom's car. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> I like went around the block and I was like, oh, this is a flat tire, mom, again. And I grabbed my mom's keys and came here. I know, I just said I changed it for you tonight if you wanted me to before I went home. Abby, was there somebody here to talk to you, or did you talk to yourself? She's doing uh, her homework. <laughs> She's doing her homework. <laughs> All right, so we are back in open session. Uh, we will move into, we're good, right? Yep, good. Yep. We'll move into 13.1, resignations, retirements. <laughs> Nicole, Nicole, sit back down. She's like, you weren't, you weren't supposed to sit down. <laughs> All right, we have one, two, four resignations and one retirement on the agenda tonight. Um, the one retirement. Um, for Laura Marone, principal at Washington Elementary School. I move the board approve the resignations and retirement as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second then to approve the resignations and retirements as presented. All in favor? Aye. 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 All those not, same sign. All right, on to 13.2. We have one leave of absence for your consideration tonight. I move the board approve the leave of absence as presented. Second. Motion and a second to approve the leave of absence is presented. All in favor? Aye. 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 All those not, same sign. And 13.3. There are no appointments for you tonight. All right, thank you. Oh, Nicole, before you go at this point, because we've, um, we're at the end of our retirement session etc and we start going into the process of posting do we have any postings currently open or will we end up waiting until contract time frame to so, see what we're going to need yeah so all the new positions that we talked about at committee those mm -hmm. are all posted those posted march 1st and they're okay. open through the, around the 20th um so we'll start interviewing for those the end of march and okay. then um the resignations on here yep will likely get posted later this week or right after spring break okay and then we'll kind of just flow with it as things come through great thank you, you bet. all right 13.4 then is uh the appointment of board uh, uh canvassers for the april 2021 election so, um, one second. I, uh, Arch got it. I'm moving, I, I move that Joanne Kajeski, Mark DiStefano, and Michelle Franken have served as the Board of Canvassers for the April Board election. Lila Rapinski will serve as the alternate. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second then for the appointment of Board of Canvassers for the April 2021 election. All in favor? Aye. 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 All those not, same sign. All right, 13.5. All right, the board received uh, last month mm -hmm. uh, first reading for board policy updates. Uh, the board had an opportunity to present any questions, review and consider those. Uh, at this time, I'd ask that the board consider um, accepting and approving the board policy updates as presented. I'll so move. Seven. All right, we have a motion and a second then to approve the board policy updates as presented. All in favor? Aye. 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 All those not, same sign. All right, 14.1, payment of claims. I move that we approve the payment of claims of $4,228,395.41. Motion and a second then for payment of claims. Uh, roll call vote. Lisa Panzer? 
Yes. 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 All right. I have a motion for adjournment. House will move. Second. Motion and second for adjournment. All in favor? Aye. 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 All those not same sign. Who wants to start? All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Have a good evening. <laughs>